Well, there's a great humility in that. In other words, um, he's not identifying in his person, you know, the papacy. And in a sense, for many Catholics, but even people in the world, that is Catholicism, you see. So I think that's a huge gift he's given the church um, going into this uh, 21st century, this third millennium, people living so long, um, then popes shouldn't be you know, in office till they, they die at 90-something. It's a papacy that will be remembered as both troubled and effective to a certain extent. Uh, his priorities were number one, as he described it, to, in a sense, re-evangelize Europe. So one of the things that was notable about his taking the position was his describing the need to, in a sense, re-Christianize or reactivate the Catholicism in Europe. Um, myself, I was bemused that when John Paul II died, you know, there was all sorts of media coverage of his wake, you know, and all these young people who come from all over and look at the great effect he had in the church. And then as soon as he was buried and they started talking about the next conclave, it was, of course, the next pope has this big problem that none of the youth have anything to do with the church. Uh, not much success there uh, in Europe. And I think this is the problem uh, among many other factors of secularization was then the emergence of the pedophilia and cover-up and perjury in Ireland and Germany and so forth. Uh, so again, this sort of just cuts off at the knees, you know, perhaps what he wanted as an agenda. The effectiveness, I would say, would be his agenda internally um, for the church. Internally, not the Vatican so much, but um, in terms of carrying through what the Pope was doing the, the predecessor, John Paul II, with regard to appointing bishops and cardinals uh, right in line with their own uh, agenda, John Paul's and, and now Benedict's agenda, uh, including for the Pope, I think, dear to his, this Pope, dear to his heart, um, uh, a, kind, a kind of modification of the reform of the Mass, you know, things of that, that type. So uh, scandals, both uh, child assault, abuse, uh, finances, many things like that. On the other hand, I would say he's probably set things up successfully such that they will elect someone who will continue his agenda. What I worry about myself, because I have a great love and, and dedication to the Roman Catholic Church as a member and a professor and a priest, uh, is that it will that this this alienation on the part of the large body of the faithful will continue. People will identify as Catholic. They are. Uh, though I did mention the number that are also identifying as ex-Catholic. But people want rites of passage. People want their babies baptized. People want church weddings, you know, et cetera. Um, and I don't say that to be cynical. Uh, these are, are real-life identifying events that people identify themselves in the process with God, with the church through, as their uh, meeting place of God and God with them. Uh, but is it becoming more and more a Catholicism where, uh, in which, well, go for the big events and then Christmas and Easter. I mean, that's the growing phenomenon. Um, this was the case for Russian and Greek and so forth Orthodoxy, the Eastern churches, uh, about which my mom was a Russian Orthodox. I know a lot through my family and her side of the family. Uh, Again, great respect for their priests uh, and ever more it looks so esoteric and otherworldly. And you go for Easter, for Pascha. And so for me, the heartbreak in that is as a child of the 70s, uh, of a Vatican II just having happened, of an education in which we saw a church growing that would be very vital and nimble and flexible and meeting the modern world, uh, then we, it's 30 years now where that that's not the way this has turned out. Uh, and everyone has a different analysis for why, and that would be a longer conversation. But I do think it's not an exaggeration to say that Roman Catholicism in the U.S. is at a certain crossroads, and it's, they've already passed the crossroads in Europe. That was Benedict's concern, and I don't think he got very far. I would say certainly because of the influence and the pervasiveness of Catholicism in this country, even if it and it is, Catholicism is going a great deal of change in its membership. Uh, still, it's uh, 
a, a large social force uh, in this country, number one. Number two, uh, we see that social force still in regards directly to American uh, politics in the sense not just electoral politics, but politics meaning the running of the government. Uh, thus, the agenda that's been uh, placed first and foremost and loudest around abortion and now in relation to that uh, end of life um, issues is the, I think, the kind of euphemism we use. Uh, that clearly, uh, we see that the great attention the press gives, uh, the time it gives to these uh, kinds of issues with the, the bishops, the Cardinal Archbishop of, of New York, for example, uh, Timothy Dolan, very articulate, very personable, perfect for the media. Um, you know, bringing these issues in. Now, the effect again then is the man who's pope is the man who's signing off on and making the decisions about who to promote to the office of bishop throughout the hundreds of dioceses in the U.S., uh, dioceses just being the regional units, and then uh, furthermore advancing people, uh, a very small number to the office uh, or, the, or, the, or the honor of cardinal. S to this day right now in Rome, uh, Bernard Cardinal Law of Boston, the disgraced and, in a sense, exiled uh, Archbishop of Boston, uh, all indications are he holds great influence in the Vatican, where he has lived since he left the U.S. Uh, and also uh, a Cardinal Burke, uh, who had been a Vatican insider, went to the States for a while as an Archbishop in uh, St. Louis, back into the Vatican system. These two men are highly influential. And so it's not just the people in the U.S., and it's not just the one pope. It's, also, it's a matter also of the, of the men who are powerful in the, the bureaucracy of the Vatican itself. But still, there's the power of the papacy in terms of finally making those appointments, and then whom uh, the pope chooses to listen to more than others.